Thank you so much for the organizers to, for inviting me um, here and to uh, giving me an opportunity to talk and for sticking on the last day to all of you. Um, this work is, uh, I think Rodette has given a, a great talk yesterday and I will try to relate uh, also what we do and kind of draw parallels when appropriate to, uh, to the work that was presented yesterday. Uh, we are also interested in disease mechanisms, but we came to it uh, from, a, from a different approach and uh, kind of thinking of networks uh, just as tools, not as the primary uh, uh, information propagation tool, sort of. So I think it's, a, it's the other side of the coin, and then we'll see what we can do next. So uh, this work is primarily done by Aziz Mislini, who is a senior PhD uh, in my lab. PhD student. So uh, thinking about the disease mechanism uh, in complex human diseases, and uh, uh, in complex human diseases we're expecting uh, multiple proteins to be disrupted, right? And uh, what's coming out from the literature and from uh, this kind of, um, uh, from the clinical and biological literature is that different genes may also be disrupted in different ways. Um, so, uh, in say this uh, three gene toy example, we have a, uh, in the first gene in patient one, we have missense variant. In the, so patient two, in the same gene, but it might be a regulatory uh, variant, like an enhancer variant. In gene two, it may be yet another aberration, like a splicing or de novo missense mutation aberration. And patient three, uh, in patients five and six, it's gene three, but it's something else. But all of this together, so any of these things could happen to cause the phenotype of the disease, or multiple of these things would happen. So this makes uh, discovery of the actual mechanism really, really uh, difficult with uh, tools that study one gene at a time, right? Um, so the the data that can be used in principle to identify these uh, methods uh, is uh, diverse, let us say, right? So there's a lot of uh, variation, coding and non-coding variation. Then there are uh, structural aberrations of the genome, there's methylation, uh, post-translational uh, post, uh, modifications, etc. And all of these things can affect the disease. So in uh, GWAS, uh, people, that people have started by looking uh, at variation across, common variation across the genome, they've looked at non-coding variants, but uh, they, they've only looked at common ones. And so uh, GWAS has not resulted in uh, kind of the kind of the break in, uh, breakthrough uh, results that people have expected. Um, when we started looking at uh, rare variants, and then we started looking at uh, we started looking mostly at coding variation, right? Because it's really, really hard to attribute rare variation to uh, some kind of cohesive unit. We simply don't have the power to detect uh, the rare variation in the non-coding areas of the genome. And so, um, uh, but there are many, many variant aggregation methods that use, uh, uh, that combine this variance and have the power with smaller sample sizes to actually uh, identify the genes of interest, even without using the networks. Then pe people started using networks, and of course, uh, uh, networks uh, gave uh, a lot of um, um, more power to detect the, the genes involved in the disease, but um, there are sometimes there are problems with validation and replication, uh, but that's that's not the only problem. The, the problem is that we're still stuck with genes, whether we are using networks or not, or not. So um, for the the networks, at least in this area, when looking at uh, gene aggregation and variant aggregation methods, there are multiple tools. So DAPL, I think, is the favorite tool that's used at uh, Broad and. Uh, and um, there are several other tools, uh, and then yesterday uh, wrote that talk. So this, uh, I, I want to say that uh, the talk was to discover the disease mechanism, but the evaluation is quite different from the way that these tools work, which are association tools, right? They're trying to figure out whether we can explain or how much variance we can ex explain in the status of the patient in a case control type of scenario. And um, 
so in our case, we compare to uh, DMG was, which is uh, another one of the network propagation tools, uh, but uh, it ha it had the code available, so uh, we use it of the ones that were uh, on top. So DMG was it takes the p values as uh, the labels for the nodes, and then it starts from the seed genes, and it includes greedily genes and the gene set according to the network if uh, they increase the test statistic, some test statistic that they have defined. And um, uh, kind of a, a small limitation, and this might need to be adjusted, but a small limitation is that to include a gene, in, another gene in a set, it has to improve the um, kind of the variance explained by 10%, which is a lot. As you get a bigger and bigger set, it becomes very difficult to improve the accuracy by 10%. And so that's a kind of a one of the limitations. And the output is a set of genes that are ranked by strength of association with a phenotype. So I think this, this, this part can be also done to um, kind of extend the work that was presented yesterday to be comparable directly to these methods. So the disadvantages of uh, most of the existing methods is that um, in the uh, scenarios where the, the networks are used, the statistics of the uh, genes are pre-computed in advance, and then you propagate the information. So some kind of label is, is said, OK, this gene it has this many mutations, or is mutated or not. And these kind of things are pre-computed in advance, right? It's not, um, uh, but mostly with the p-values especially. It depends on the, the size of the original uh, discovery data set. Uh, to, um, so so that's, a, that's one limitation. It's pre-computed, and then the information is propagated across the network. And of course, the, it in, ignores the, the intergenic variation as well. So the way we started thinking about uh, the disease, um, kind of discovering a more global disease mechanism, is we said, okay, we have a, say, heritable disease. Um, and uh, what happens with a heritable disease? Multiple protein functions are disrupted. How can they be disrupted? Well, uh, they can be disrupted either by the quality, so the coding of the protein, or what it looks like, or by the level and the gene expression. So there are, there are some ways in which the coding variants also affect the gene expression, but uh, most of the variants, they kind of affect the quality of the protein, and that's not, not modulating the level. And of course, the gene expression is really kind of an agglomeration of all the things that can happen in a regulatory sense, right? CNVs would affect the genes in a gene expression way, the DNA methylation, microRNAs, uh, and a lot of the intergenic variation. So this is a, my motivation for the, including the gene expression uh, as you did yesterday. But, um, so some of the things uh, that we miss in, in this way, in this model, uh, there are definitely, if there are novel pro uh, proteins like prions and cut genes and cut fusions, you would have to figure out that uh, separately. Uh, but um, the, uh, we have to deal with noisy gene expression, we have to deal with, with all the usual things that people kind of have to deal with when they start including gene expression. All right, so once we include the gene expression, we are now able to survey all of these different methods at the, uh, also, or all of these different uh, data also by proxy. So what we do, how, how do we incorporate uh, gene expression and uh, coding information? Um, we basically have exome variants, and we also uh, compute the pre-compute the harmfulness for each of the variants, and that we do with a CAD or N of R most recently, uh, existing tools for computing the harmfulness priors. Uh, and then we have the expression levels for the regulatory aberration, and then we have an aberration per, per gene. It's a kind of a score. And then, of course, we look at all of the genes simultaneously, and we include the gene network for, for the propagation. So this is what it looks like as a graphical model that we actually implemented. Um, we have... Um, this is, this is just for one gene. So the, the filled in uh, triangles are the actual data, and the, the not filled in triangles are the predictions, uh, prior predictions that we pre compute in advance of the algorithm. So what we do is we have uh, this data, and we combine harmfulness 
and um, the coding variation information. So each one of the triangles is actually a variant, an observed variant in that gene uh, across all the patients that we have in the cohort. So we have um, this kind of uh, scores uh, per, per gene that combine first harmfulness and the evidence, and then we have a factor that combines all of these um, variant per variant essentially scores now to into a score uh, of coding variation score per gene. Okay, uh, we also have a quantity aberration score per gene as well. And then we have, a, of course, a factor which combines the quantity and the quality of the scores into a gene state. And we do it, so here there are three genes, but reality is we don't really pre-filter genes. So we have the 20,000 genes that we have in the data. This would be the, the size of the model. And this is per patient, and of course, a single patient is an, in, uh, an instantiation, is a single instantiation of this graphical model. Yep. Some missing data. Could you still integrate? So let's say. For yes. Some... Yes. Yeah. So one of the good things about this method, of course, we want to have uh, um, coding and different uh, and expression data for the same patients because then we can say what is the how is the mechanism disrupted in that patient? Is it in a regulatory or the coding sense? But uh, we actually don't have to have that information to still be able to do the inference uh, across the patients. It will just be uh, integrated over. Okay, so, uh, and the phenotype uh, here in the simplest case uh, that I will be showing the results, it's case control, so patient status. Um, so in, uh, at the end of the day, it's a supervised problem. Uh, we use networks. Uh, this is how the networks are used as a prior or soft constraints. And uh, this, uh, each factor basically says whether the genes are, uh, whether the genes uh, are connected in a, in a network of our, um, that, that we are exploring. So for, for example, in BioGrid or the networks that we, we discussed yesterday. Can you explain yes, I will explain exactly how they affect the model. So uh, these are the factor-based models, and usually um, in a kind of classic MRFs, there is this parameter, parameterized uh, um, factor, which um, is the same for every node, right? But we have a slightly more difficult problem in gene networks. It's not uh, a nice grid, and uh, there are other problems, like degree distributions start to matter a lot because there's such a diversity, right? So the large node degrees um, and the discrepancy between degrees can really skew the type of message passing. Uh, so I should mention that we use message passing like a loopy belief propagation for inference in our model. But um, they can skew this, this kind of propagation. Uh, also, in a complex uh, disease, when we are talking about the disease mechanism, we expect only a few genes to be on uh, in the end. So we, that's a hyperparameter in our model. So let's say 10, 20, or 100 genes to be on the um, uh, overall in the network, which means it's going to be very hard to uh, to, very important to keep to keep that constraint and not let let um, let it grow out of proportion. And uh, in our uh, work, we uh, made an, uh, an assumption that if we do not have the data to support a gene to be on, this was my question to you yesterday, the gene will not be on just because it's a neighbors in the network. So. Um, uh, we implement that with a directed asymmetric parameterized uh, networks, and uh, this is what it looks like. So um, I guess this is more what, <laughs> what it looks like. So um, uh, the off genes, we are trying to make it so that the off genes are not informative. So if the gene, if the neighbor is off, then your probability of being on and off is 50%. If the gene is, or... Um, however low it is, the prior. If the gene is on, then it matters. Then that information gets, uh, gets propagated, and we have this delta uh, parameter, which is also pre-computed based on the degree. Now, I'd like to give you intuition about how delta is set. So um, scenario one, uh, where we have a gene where all the neighbors are kind of on, right? And 
I think in most uh, propagation, um, the uh, network propagation methods, this would basically imply that the gene, uh, that uh, the inner gene will be on because this, this, is, this is what these methods are meant to, to kind of do. But of course for us, if there's no evidence from the data, we do not want that gene to be on. And so uh, it might have a very little, info, very little support for, for being on, but it has to have some data of its own in a, in a few patients that either it, it's affected in a kind of a coding or regulatory sense. So um, the scenario one and the scenario two is that, uh, again, there is no evidence from the data. The degree is high, so by chance, several of the genes will be on. And of course, we want the small contributions also not to be able to turn it on. So uh, this is uh, kind of the intuition, and this is an upper bound. And when we compute delta, we basically set it to, to this value. And uh, we have some low, very low prior over all the genes to be on, right? It's very, very low prior. Then we have the max network messages, which is basically the scenarios where the genes are on, that they're trying to propagate this information. I am in a disease mechanism to its neighbors. And the uh, weak network messages where they are not, um, they're not on, and then we are trying to propagate that information. The D is the degree of the node that it's propagated to, and M is the putative size of the mechanism that we assume. Um, just a, I was thinking yesterday, it's like a, like a tax break. Mm. <laughs> um, so um, this, is, this is our, our approach. Um, it's actually not that different. When you think about uh, loopy belief propagation over a network with these parameters, it's similar to propagating, doing uh, um, diffusion over a network, uh, over a weighted network, right? Where the weights kind of depend on the degree or corrected by the de for the degree. But uh, we, uh, the difference, the major difference is that it's because it's part of the global model, we are not set uh, with the labels at all times, right? We propagate the information and then it goes back to integrate with the evidence from the data. And then we keep doing that. So this is, I think, the major difference in, um, in, in the kind of this graphical model type of approach versus taking a network, labeling the nodes, and then propagating the information on that label node. It's kind of, it's a one pass, one iteration of this method. Uh, in a way. Um, and also we do not, because of these kind of assumptions that we made about what the disease mechanism will be and should look like, we do not rely as much on the topology of the network by design because that's what we chose. So there is no way for, uh, in our method for a node to be on if all of its neighbors are on. So the TP53 will not always be on. It has to have the evidence from the data, which it, in breast cancer it would be, but uh, not in every... Uh, cancer. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about simulation. So we validated, uh, we kind of compared and looked at the robustness of the method primarily in the simulated data because we simply don't know the truth in any of the complex diseases that we are currently studying. So um, what we did is we simulated uh, exome uh, data f through kind of the evolutionary process, this Krukov model from 2009. And uh, we randomly selected genes, uh, nearby genes in the network. And then we looked at uh, everybody who had aberrations in those genes, were labeled as patients. And then we sampled N cases and N controls. And this is the scenario. And the number of the genes uh, that were sampled, we looked at 10, 20, 50, and 100. I think I have more for the smaller kind of sample sizes. So just to remind, this is dmg -was. It takes as input as p-values. So it uh, first pre-processes the data in univariate fashion to identify which genes are uh, important. And then it greedily adds genes to the set. So that's what we, what we are comparing to, to now. Um, so in the simulated mechanism of 10, 10 genes, this is sensitivity and the precision. And you can see that, uh, and the sample size is on the x-axis. So um, SCAT O is the most commonly, most widely used method for uh, variant aggregation, rare variant aggregation in uh, uh, 
processing exome data in association studies. So this is SCATO, which obtain, obtaining p-values from the SCATO method and looking at the DMJYS type of network aggregation. Of course, here there could be different ways uh, of aggregating. So. Uh, you can see that as, uh, for the small sample sizes, it's very difficult to identify the true genes, uh, regardless of the matter. I think what's interesting is that uh, with respect to just obtaining the p-values and lo looking at the network, dmj was is less sensitive to the smaller sample size, right? Because if there is a way to have ranked p-values, and if that ranking doesn't change, it can still keep adding the, the genes even if there is not enough evidence, whereas SCATO just wouldn't call it a, G, um, a finding because it doesn't have the power. But uh, unfortunately, as, it, uh, as the sample size get larger, the networks are not, in this particular case, are not really uh, given more power to identify. So uh, in some sense, you could argue here that if you had uh, n going to infinity, you wouldn't need the network. Uh, you wouldn't need the network. Maybe, maybe that's the right kind of approach. Of course, uh, here, as um, for the precision, it, it identifies uh, the problem of DMG was is that it identifies genes of guilty by association, tries to first add the uh, direct neighbors. And in our cases, we sampled direct and second degree neighbors. And the second degree neighbors, without the first degree neighbors, is really hard to add. So um, in, in our um, kind of explorations of real data, we did not find um, the tightly neat subnetworks to be really implicated by the data. And so we kind of wanted to relax that assumption. Assumption in our method allows us to do that. Barabasi showed that at least the module should be connected. So not tightly connected, but at least connected. You know, you had this high profile publication in. Uh, Whatever science nature. Uh, I about. think I'm being recorded, so um, <laughs> we'll take this uh, question offline if you don't mind, because this is well, this is real data. Well, I'm the, saying that in your simulation you could also yes. uh, uh, show us the performance of uh, DMG was when it is a connected. A connected seed. We can do that. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's not true in reality, but for for Abash's sake, of course, we could do. That. Um, sorry. The, uh, for the 20 uh, genes, of course, with the same sample size, it's, it becomes harder to uh, identify the, the genes. And uh, the DMG was, I think, because of primarily because of that 10% constraint of adding it to the, to the, um, the gene set, it becomes more difficult because now each gene really has a... Uh, uh, less, less penetrance in a way. And so uh, the evidence is smaller, and so it can add a few more genes to a set, but it becomes harder to find any genes that have 10% uh, improvement. Um, there's a, an example of sensitivity to, to noise kind of thing. I'm not sure we haven't conversion the best way to represent this data, but if you remove edges, Right. If you remove edges, then um, the DMG was. So what you have to look at is at the median, and if you remove the edges, then uh, DMG was, uh, of course, is affected. Right, because now it cannot add the genes that it needs to add. If, if you add edges, it's not so bad because uh, since it adds uh, genes greedily, the the genes that it wants to add are still in the set of the neighbors, and so it will uh, have access to those genes, and it still can add those genes. So. The difference is not much when you start perturbing, when, when the networks are noisy by uh, adding spurious edges. The removing of the edges and the connectivity makes a difference to, to have an access to those genes. Um, also, this is the robustness of uh, our method. So our method here is in pink. Uh, the red uh, is no expression, not adding expression. The lambda, it says uh, lambda, which I didn't introduce before. This is saying that it's 50% coding, 50% regulatory. So in 50% of the patients, it will be mutation, and 50% it will be regulation. So of course, if you remove expression, it has the biggest um, 
the biggest effect on the results. Whereas if it's, you remove harmful, harmfulness depriers that we have the harmfulness and the networks, uh, the effect is a little bit less. So you can see that the networks matter more uh, with a smaller sample size, but as the sample size grows, uh, even though we sample genes from the network, uh, removing the network during the inference process does not affect us too much. Um, so one of the advantages of identifying these joint subnetworks, I honestly, from the exploration of the, the real data that, that we've had and work with a lot of different uh, public and uh, kind of local data sets, I have not found that it's really subnetworks that come out as the, as the genes, perhaps because we don't have enough data. But um, I, I think that uh, th this has been our experience. With, with the real data, so I'm happy that the method is actually not as sensitive to that. And also it's less sensitive to the noise in the network, um, removing edges as well as adding edges. So uh, this is the TCGA breast cancer data, and it's also my question yesterday. We tried to look at more, we had the exome and RNA-seq data, we looked at, um, because we kind of have this case control scenario, uh, we looked at each subtype against uh, other against the rest or against other subtypes. So um, in our case, we were very interested in luminal A because we, uh, in luminal uh, cancer A and B because we have a collaborator who is willing to test uh, the the function of the genes that we find. Um, so comparing to other methods, uh, this, these are uh, kind of variant aggregation and also DMG was. Comparing to other methods, uh, uh, we found a lot more genes and uh, um, that, that were found to be important. The other methods uh, find either GATA3 or C-alpha, and uh, C-alpha finds P P PIK3CA, and of course, if this gene is not, if this gene is not found, uh, this is like uh, for luminal cancer, this is, it means the method is not working well. Unfortunately, none of these genes are directly connected in the network, and so the DMG was, was not able to use the, the power that it has from integrating network data, and so it actually didn't find any of the, of the genes. Uh, this is, this is the, the PIK3CA uh, uh, gene. This is from the C bio portal. It exp it, it's present in 42% of the uh, breast cancer patients. So um, I, I think uh, it's kind of nice that there is some, um, some kind of an exclusion hypothesis in the end. We didn't put it in, but um, I think what's, what's also interesting and what actually is a bit of a disadvantage of our method, what, what do graphical models do with the, the random variables, right? They are trying to explain the data. They are trying to fit the data and give the, the best uh, likelihood. And so if we add uh, genes, if we turn on genes that explain some of the data for patients that have um, sort of mutations in uh, other genes, it says, well, this patient is already explained. So you don't get much of a benefit from detecting it, but for the gene, of course, and I think in some sense in the network propagation methods, this is not a problem. For, for other genes, right, you take the whole evidence across all the patients um, that, you, that you can combine. So from, from our preliminary kind of um, Analysis, uh, we are speculating that in luminal breast cancer, the, the, the coding uh, variation can um, explain about 55% of the patients. We found in our method that the coding and regulatory um, uh, jointly uh, for the same genes, coding and regulatory variation is in, present in about 15% of the patients and regulatory in about 20% of the patients. So, uh, Schrieder yesterday asked me if you could identify this with a differential expression, and the answer is no, because if it's 20%, you might be able to build good signatures, but you will not be able to identify the, um, the actual disease mechanism. This, if what we are finding is the, the, the true disease mechanism, we are uh, just applied for a grant to, to test all of this in the lab, of course. Um, I want to give you another vignette uh, about, yes? Yes, All right. don't need. Um, and uh, uh, another vignette with a much smaller cancer. This is medulloblastoma, and uh, we're working with uh, Mike Taylor at our hospital, who has over a thousand patients, of course. 
uh, in this case, we actually had germline whole, ex whole uh, genome sequencing uh, data. So um, for the germline, um, we, we had both germline and somatic uh, mutations, but the numbers of samples for which we had the sequencing data was much, much smaller. So the 31 Sony Hedgehog patients, they look usually very, very different and kind of in terms of dif differential expression, but they were looking for uh, genetic signatures. So basically these would be the predisposing signatures to uh, getting this uh, childhood cancer. And um, so what we do is uh, we can uh, estimate the posterior probability of each patient having a specific, let's say, subtype, right? So uh, we picked uh, Sony Hedgehog and classified the patients as Sony Hedgehog or not. So these are the posterior probabilities for each of the patients. And you can see that in Sony Hedgehog, a lot of them have a high posterior probability of being Sony Hedgehog and the other subtypes not except for this too. But there are some patients that were not characterized as a Sony Hedgehog. And what we can do in, in this case is we can start looking at the um, kind of what was the reason that it was classified. So for each individual patient, we can go back and look at the posterior probabilities over the genes that we would implicate for that in, in the disease mechanism to implicate for that specific patient. So kind of trying to figure out what actually happens. So patch one is of course regulating a, uh, Sonia Hedgehog at some level and so this is, uh, uh, it makes sense. So uh, for patch, patch one mutation to be the highest but for this uh, little one is a SUFU and SUFU mutation is associated with medulloblastoma but there are also a whole slew of other mutations. Something is, else is wrong with this patient. And so we're actually working with Mike Taylor now to identify the sub subtypes or subtypes of subgroups or subgroups of subtypes. And in Sony Hedgehog, it turns out that there are three or four based on other type of omics uh, data. So uh, this, this is, I, I like uh, having uh, probabilistic models in that sense because we can go back and try to figure out what actually happened in the data according to our model and then we can have hypothesis for testing like we kind of discussed yesterday. So with that, I would like to thank um, you and uh, my lab and especially Aziz, this is his uh, thesis work and um, my collaborators in medulloblastoma and in breast cancer. Because you showed the, the uh, cancer genes, the breast cancer genes, commenting that they're not connected in the network. But uh, some of them is just because um, which network was used, I mean, whether it's just, I mean, in my network they are connected. So, <laughs> so whose network it is in this sense? That, that, is that lack of our data in the network that we don't see them connected? Or do you feel that they really uh, are disconnected? Um, so my uh, experience with computational biology in general was that I studied with networks because this is, I did social networks in my PhD and it was a natural way to, to kind of get into the field. And I very quickly uh, realized that there is a lot of noise in the network. And so if we use network as a given, um, it's, it's hard to know what is there and what is not, and that makes it difficult to interpret the results. So is it the algorithm that is wrong, or is it the, uh, in, in a, the data that we are supplying it? And so um, it is possible that they are truly really connected, and we simply don't know. Some of them are connected, and some of them are not connected yet. Uh, we used Biogrid because of the, there, there were several suggestions yesterday that we can try. But I think the good thing is that while we benefit from having the network as a prior, we, we are not uh, hampered if we have the data supporting these genes. We are not hampered by uh, not having those connections in. So for me, having the connections that I truly believe are there, so kind of having reducing the false positive effect, I think is... Uh, is more important here. Uh, for other methods, it's, it's different, of course. Methods that rely on connectivity uh, are different, and so maybe uh, false negatives are much worse. And so maybe for DMG was we should have used the string and aggregation and much, much bigger networks. I guess it is uh, 
may I rephrase my question? Because that was more philosophical than concrete about the method. So uh, at the end, you find the genes. If you go back, you probably find some relationship between them if they are in the same diseases, even if they are not connected in our noisy networks. We, that's, that's the whole goal, right? That's, then we are starting to look at whether they are co-regulated, whether there are transcription factors that potentially one is the transcription factor of something else, which is a cascading down something else. And, and that allows us, by generating this hypothesis, to uncover new biology. Yes, we think that there is some relation between these networks, but also Examples that I'm giving, right? The method, the motivation of the method, uh, it was a bit tricky because the motivation of the method was for um, complex disease, not not necessarily cancer, right? And but the results that I gave you are for cancer, and so um, I think there are slightly different assumptions and there are slightly different uh, advantages and and disadvantages of of what we will get. But I think this is one way if we rely. If we don't necessarily strongly rely on the connectivity of the network, then we can generate new hypotheses to uncover new biology because we will go to f try to figure out what, what, what is actually the mechanism uh, functionally of these genes that we are finding, right? Because ultimately we want to figure out the cure and uh, the kind of the treatment programs. So in your uh, noise analysis, were you dropping out edges or genes or edges. edges? So have you tried? So thinking about something that's a little bit outside of cancer, where maybe the um, you know genes might be less well measured. Have you thought about dropping out sort of whole genes or even sets of cancer genes to see how it responds to sort of less pres less full data in your? Um, I'm not sure uh, that would help us much because we include all the genes. That are that we have data for. We have if we have coding variation or a differential expression for these genes, we can include them in sing singletons even if they are not in the network. So there is no point. Well, so I guess I'm wondering. So if you included them as singletons, how much does your performance drop off? So I think if I'm thinking about it, doesn't. Right? We are finding disjoint nodes. <coughs> they are not necessarily. Singletons, but we are not. W the point is, we will still find a node if it's uh, greatly supported by the by the data. So, I think we are kind of doing. So we don't have the simulation experiments to show exactly that, but we do have real data in that in our network behaves like that, and we are able to find them. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking of sort of if you start thinking about looking at. Uh, diseases that are associated with genes that are not maybe as well represented in the PPI network as things like uh, most of these cancers. It doesn't. It, it looks like from the data analysis that we have done that it does not affect our method. Yeah. So what happens if you don't consider the network at all? Oh, well, I showed uh, in a in the robustness uh, experiment that there is a, a bit of a drop, but uh, not much. And of course, as the size of the data grows, you get more evidence for implicating genes, and then. But it does help. Uh, yeah. If yeah, it just doesn't hurt as much. But All right. Let's uh, thank the speaker again.